that you basically live in psychological servitude to them. The eggshell walking is a reminder of that almost continuity between them and you, that poor boundary where it's like one of those parasite alien movies where they have fully infiltrated your psyche and sucked it out and stuck pleasing them, right? So there's a couple of things you need to remember about narcissism. As a rule, people with narcissism do tend to be quite impulsive, meaning that they almost look like they have almost like an attention deficit. And a lot of narcissists out there excuse this element of their behavior and their listening by saying they have ADHD when in fact they don't. They've never been tested. It really hasn't been confirmed. And it's very selective. They have plenty of attention when it's something that serves them well. But when it comes to other people, they have no attention whatsoever. ADHD isn't quite that selective. So they're very impulsive, they're very inattentive. And so in that way, they're not paying attention to anything. Why? Because they really have a lot of contempt for information unless it's directly relevant to them, A, and B, if it fits their world view. So narcissists do something very interesting. They don't pay attention to what you're saying or even to information when they don't like it. So in other words, if they're being told a bit of bad news or they're being told something that's going to inconvenience them or they're being told something that's not as fancy, grandiose and, you know, zaza zoo as they want it to be, they just tune out. That's why they're so terrible at listening to the mundane stuff of life like, hey, could you pick up some milk today or hey, don't forget to put the trash cans out. Tuesday is trash day. They often zoop. They don't pay attention because there's absolutely no relevance and those things stand to inconvenience them. They have to stop at the store, they have to put out the trash cans, and in their little grandiose universes, they should only have to listen to very important things that fit what they want. The human, the human cognition, when in a healthy person, is very dynamic. In a healthy person, we can let in all kinds of information even information we don't like because we have to integrate it to sort of come up with better strategies. So if you think of very, very, very early hunter gatherers, they'd be like, hmm, this is interesting. We keep coming over here and there's nothing to hunt. So maybe we should go to the other side of the river. A narcissist would keep kind of hanging out on the wrong side of the river because they can't be bothered to integrate the new information. So it is in very much, in, it is very much a sort of arrogant dismissiveness. Like, ugh, why are you expecting me to listen to this? As anyone who's ever been in a relationship with a narcissist knows, this can be maddening because you, are, you have very clear, you often many times you'll get to the point right here, look at me in the eyes. Are you listening? Okay, I need you to X, Y, and Z. You need them to do something. And they'll look at you and they're nodding. But if those things aren't interesting to them and they don't want to do them, they're very conveniently going to forget them. And if you get very insistent with them like, hey, this morning you looked me right in the eyes and said you would do X, Y, and Z. They're like, oh my gosh, like why do you, why do you get so intense about these things? There's your gaslight, okay? So now no matter how clearly you communicate, and anyone out there who's ever been in couples therapy knows how frustrating it is. What do couples therapists usually say? You got to communicate. You got to communicate clearly. You got to communicate mindfully. La, 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 la. None of that works in a narcissistic relationship because you literally could put their head in some sort of thing where you turn it towards you and they still aren't listening to you because they're not interested. They don't care. This is very, very problematic because <coughs> <coughs> this is very, very problematic because whether this is a work relationship, an intimate relationship, or a family relationship, it means things get missed and don't get done. And these could be important things, an important bill that had a deadline that had to go out in the mail, a medication that may have needed to be picked up, a contract that needed to get signed and off to the client. If the narcissist doesn't care or they devalue you, they consistently devalue your words. And a lot of us kind of get into the kind of delusional sense that maybe if I keep repeating myself enough, they'll get it. Oh no, no matter how many times you repeat it, if they don't value you and they don't value the information, they ain't going to get it. And when you start reacting to that, they're going to gaslight you. So it feels like very much like a dead end. 
Some people will say, you know what, I'm going to put it in writing. I'm going to put it in an email. I'm going to put it in a text. Same rules apply. Oftentimes their defense there is, I'm, I'm ADHD, favorite narcissistic defense. Or they'll say things like, I'm so stressed, or this isn't that important to me, or why are you making such a big deal out of this? So they either use a rationalization, they use denial, or they use gaslighting to rationalize not listening, even when it's put into writing. Now in workplace settings, this need to repeat and put things in writing tends to work a bit better because especially in anything other than a very small business, there is a bit of a chain of command, right? So ultimately you could even show an HR department and say, listen, here's the 10 emails asking this person to do this and it never got done. And that's something that someone could actually follow up on. But in a close relationship, there ain't no judge and jury and there ain't no HR department. It's you then pulling out the emails and the text and saying, hey, I have now asked you to do this so many times and that's when the narcissist will accuse you of being petty and saying, oh my gosh, you're making too big a deal out of this instead of acknowledging the fact that they simply devalue you and your words and pretty much have contempt for anything that brings them out of their grandiose heads and down into the regular world where people have to put out trash cans, empty dishwashers and buy milk at the store. So this, this idea, though, of having to repeat things over and over again is what leaves a lot of people feeling really destabilized in these relationships. Because we were taught as kids, like, well, if you say things enough, you'll remember them, right? Like, think of how we've even studied for tests. I'm going to keep repeating the state capitals until I get them. That's typically how learning works. Most of us don't have contempt for the things we learn. We may not want to, and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, I'm not that interested. And the less interested we are in something, the harder it is to learn it. So sometimes we do need to repeat the learning over and over and over again. We're all a little guilty of this. But when people tell us to do something, simply out of our empathy or respect for the other person, we will listen long enough. We may even say, I heard that and I may not be able to do it, or I heard it and roll our eyes when we go put the trash cans out. But we do it because healthy people are able to have reciprocal relationships where we can listen and we can do it and we can also learn. Not so for the narcissist. The constantly needing to repeat yourself to them is maddening. Some of them will even acknowledge like, oh, I, I can't listen to things if they don't matter to me. It's very arrogant and it's very dismissive. But because so many people are narcissist enablers, they let them get away with it. They're like, hey, let's put post-its on the front door and on their dashboard and on their keychain and on their phone. We enable them. But what we forget is all the post-its, all the reminders, all the alarms and buzzes and dings and pings in the world are not going to make a narcissist listen and do the thing you need them to do if they devalue it, if they have contempt for it. They need to see it as a path to the thing that they need. Sometimes, yeah, they'll put out the trash begrudgingly, but by the time you go through the whole dog, by the time you go through the whole dog and pony show of getting them to put out the trash, what happens over time is you learn like, oh my God, it's so much easier to, for me to put the trash out myself. It is so much easier for me to empty the dishwasher by myself. And guess what? In a weird way, then the narcissist has won, right? Because now they're off the hook because you don't ask them anymore. This is an interesting balancing act for me when I'm working with individuals trying to manage narcissistic relationships. Your narcissistic partner your narcissistic parent, your narcissistic boss isn't a child. Your opportunity to shape their behavior has pretty much largely subsided, especially for a narcissist who isn't as prone to being able to learn because of their dismissive quality and dismissive nature. You have to ask yourself, okay, it would be great if they put out the trash, but they're not gonna. Maybe the workaround for me is put out the trash. Someone may call you an enabler, but at another level, it may very well be that I can't get out of this relationship and I do not want to have a fight every Thursday morning about these trash cans, so I'm going to do it myself. Repeating it over and over is probably not going to yield anything. And even if they do start putting out those trash cans, they're going to act as though they have found the cure to cancer. I put out the trash cans, don't I get one? Come on, notice me. So they need so much validation that once again you're thinking, I'm just going to let out the trash cans because it feels more gross 
to have to validate them for putting out the trash cans than to get my hands dirty putting the trash cans out myself. Narcissistic relationships by definition are limited. You have to have realistic expectations. Yep, you're going to have to empty the dishwasher. Yep, you're going to have to be the one who files those documents at the end of the day. It's up to you to decide how much of this you want to do to maintain this relationship. In some cases, like I said, you can't leave. In cases when you can, the fact of the matter is repeating it, post-its and all the rest of it are not likely to get this person to step up to the plate. It really then comes down to you to recognize realistically and radically the limitations of this relationship and stop repeating yourself. The repeating yourself actually takes more toll on you than it does the narcissist who just is going to hit back with gaslighting and minimizing you and maybe even mocking you, calling you too intense, too obsessive compulsive, or my favorite, they'll often call you too controlling. So, yep, no, you're not losing your mind because you find yourself repeating yourself over and over and over again with a narcissist, like some sort of dreamy little kid or really oppositional adolescent. They just don't value your words. They're very impulsive. They're very inattentive, and they just don't care. It's really all about choosing your battles and figuring out how you can feel sane in this relationship. Have you ever had the experience with a narcissistic person? that they consistently just don't answer a pointed question you ask them? Drop that one in the comments. I'm guessing we're gonna see a lot of yeses because it's very much one of their gambits. They just don't answer the question. So let's break that down. Now listen, it's not, narcissistic people have not cornered the market on this, right? It isn't just them, let's be fair. Anyone who is passive aggressive or shifty or grifty, they don't answer the question either. But I got to tell you, it's definitely a classical part of the narcissistic ground game. And if you have ever spent many hours in a text battle with a narcissistic person or even an in-person battle with someone with this kind of personality, it'll often keep coming back to this same issue. They don't answer the question. It's an interesting trick, a sort of a con, a grifty, slimy kind of trick, but it can be maddening and confusing unless you know it's happening. And then when you can see they are not answering the question, you can set a boundary and break out of the toxic cycle. So let's play it out. Maybe in an intimate relationship. So let's play it out what it would look like in an intimate relationship. You. You say, hey, did you stay out late with that person from work? They say, what person? You say, come on, you know what person, that new person on your team, the one you just said, like moved here from New York or someone. They say, oh, that person. You say, well, did you stay out late with them last night? They say, why are you asking this again and again? We have a major deadline coming up at work. It's all hands on deck. You ask, did you stay out late with them last night? They say, I am wiped out with these deadlines. I need a break. Maybe we can go to the beach this weekend. You say, oh my God, why can't you just answer a simple question? They say, I'm not answering a ridiculous question. On top of everything else I'm going through, I get to come home to this. Remember how you wanted us to be able to get that part of the house upgraded? You keep talking about it? Well, if we can get this deadline done and get the bonuses, I'll be able to get that done for the house. Can we just go to sleep? I am working like a crazy person for us, and yet I get to come home to interrogation just because you don't have enough going on. Hmm. Did the question ever get answered? No, it didn't. Well, let me give you another example. Imagine this happening in a family. You say, hey, Ma, why did you ask my daughter about my work stuff? Why didn't you just come to me? Your parent says, what are you talking about? I don't know about any of your work stuff. You say, you asked Mary yesterday about my work stuff. I don't want my daughter in the middle. What did you want to know? Why did you approach her? Your parent says, don't be silly. Mary stuff, makes stuff up. She's dramatic. You say, I would prefer you didn't ask her these things. 
I just want to understand why you did it so we can avoid it in the future. Why did you ask her that? The parent, your parent says, when did having a conversation become about asking? We were just talking about life. You're being ridiculous. And once again, you're trying to put a wedge between me and Mary. Did your question get answered? No, it did not. And I know many of you listening to these scenarios I'm laying out to you, you're thinking, mm, Dr. Romney, there's a lot of gaslighting going on here. Yeah, there is. Not answering the question is in fact sort of a kind of a sub form of gaslighting. Because the way the narcissistic person operates is not only to distract and de deflect, but also to sometimes shift blame or paint you as being overly sensitive or dramatic. And in doing all that, then the question doesn't get answered, right? At the end of these two sort of sample conversations I give you, not only did the people not get any resolution, the question didn't get answered, and they felt worse because in the case of the couple, the person asking the question about the inappropriate hours with the questionable work person, the person asking the questions was painted as demanding. The narcissistic person presented themselves as a hardworking martyr. And the person asking the question was almost blamed for that person working late. You wanted a kitchen and the price and blah, blah, blah. In the person talking with their parent, the parent, in essence, is accusing their adult child asking the questions of creating tension with a grandchild. And so after not having an the question answered, which they didn't, not only are you still left without an answer, you are left filled with negative emotion. So you're now 0 for 2, and that's not a nice feeling. Their not answering the question goes back to something else I have brought up on this channel, which is the inability of narcissistic people to answer any question that begins with why. They don't know their why. Narcissistic people are notoriously disconnected from their motivations. I think most often because it would shame the hell out of them if they did dive in. So if that person said, yes, actually, I did go out with my young colleague because I'm insecure and attention seeking and I like the power I have because I'm the boss. Do you really think they're going to answer the why? Probably not. And because they have no empathy, they also won't come back with a a more an answer that's kind like yes I was out with her and with several other people from work but I'm sorry it was wrong of me to not call I know I know the situation makes you uncomfortable you've brought it up before and I am so sorry and then next time they actually don't repeat the behavior the person using that example of the conversation with the parent why did you do that, right? That's what you're asking. Is the parent really going to say, because I have no boundaries and I believe you as my child owe me something and I feel entitled to information about your life and since you won't give it to me, I feel entitled to get it out of my granddaughter and I don't really care if it messes with my granddaughter's head. They're not going to say that. There will be no moment of the parent saying, oh, you're right, I shouldn't be doing that. There is no accountability in these relationships and that's why they're so frustrating. Narcissistic people don't answer questions because they're not, partly, not entirely, partly because they're not self-aware, because they don't feel like they should have to, because they refuse to maintain a sense of behavioral accountability, because they're oppositional and because they're entitled. You take all that, put that together, it's why you're often not able to get straight answer to questions, especially questions where the answer is shaming or uncomfortable. So how do narcissistic people avoid answering questions so well? Gaslighting, leaving you confused. Stonewalling and just oppositionally refusing to answer a question. Storming away, which is a form of stonewalling. And if you have any abandonment issues yourself, you may find yourself giving up on, on pursuing the question and trying to appease them to get them to come back. They may not answer the question by getting angry. And then you may give up on the question because you're afraid of their rage. These techniques avoid you from pushing for the answer. When you ask a question and it's not answered, then there's really no path forward. 
listen, you can't conduct your life like you're living in a court of law or in a deposition where you can force someone to answer a question. And even if you do, you still won't get an answer and 95% of the time you'll end up gaslighted. So you wonder, is there any path forward? Eh, there really isn't one except radical acceptance. They are not going to answer the question. It opens up shame. Folks with these personalities lack self-awareness. And you won't get empathy even if they do answer the question. If you push them hard enough, and sometimes they do answer it, more often than not, the answer will hurt you. Many people feel as if they have lost their reality when they ask a narcissistic question. And they may destroy themselves in the pursuit of an answer. In many cases, especially cases when it may bring up their shame, I can promise you this, you ain't getting one. Drop in the comments, have any of you been successful in getting an honest answer out of a narcissistic person? Again, it's hard because they simply may not have that skill set of doing the deep dive and honestly reflecting on an answer. Ultimately, most of their psychological resource goes into impression management, how people view them. Keep that in mind and stop trying to chase down the answers to some of these questions. It's not comfortable. You're not likely to get them, and this could be why I'm telling you, in some ways, I think the entire private investigation industry is kept in business by people trying to get the answers they simply can't get out of narcissistic people in their lives. So, question, do they like it when we walk on eggshells? Yep, they do. So, let's go to the original question, the, I'm sorry, earlier question then, is why do we walk on eggshells around the narcissistic and toxic people in our lives? You drop those reasons in there too. But the classical standard ones are to avoid their rage, to appease them, to avoid feeling guilty, and to avoid their projections and their shaming. And that makes sense to me, it makes sense to any of us. Who really, really wants to sign up for someone to yell at them and rage at them and leave you feeling miserable? Most people are conflict averse and will do what is needed to avoid conflict. We don't wanna feel bad, so we become more and more careful around these people who we're concerned that that's what's gonna happen. So what is it about narcissistic people that makes it necessary for us to walk on eggshells. Things like their rejection sensitivity, their unprocessed shame, their fear of vulnerability, their delusional grandiosity and their obsessive need to always be right, their incapability of being accountable about their faults, their short fuses. So we watch what we say, we watch what we do, we do things the way they want them, we avoid sharing our problems, we make sure we check on what kind of day they're having before we share about our day, we study their expressions and their faces, we take the temperature of the room, we avoid sharing our needs, our wants, we learn to eat when they want, eat what they want, sleep when they want, watch what they want. We give up on ourselves. We over monitor ourselves. And we take great pains to do things just the way they want them. We keep kids quiet, we keep pets quiet. And your kids learn to walk on eggshells too. Everyone does. If you do this at work, it means avoiding telling them bad news, doing things in the messed up, inefficient way that they want, even if it's more expensive and a big waste of time. But the question I started this video with was, do they like it when you walk on eggshells or any of us walk on eggshells? And yes. The narcissistic folks aren't dumb. In fact, they're quite clever, right? Smart. They notice stuff and they notice that people are being careful around them or that they're getting their and that the narcissist knows they're getting away their way and the reason they like it is because it means they're in control. They have the power. Sometimes they may even brag about it. It can be performative and they want people to see, I run my family with an iron fist. Look at everyone around here. They're scared of me. It's a source of pride that everyone is being so careful around them. 
because the narcissistic folks have little empathy, they do not care that they are causing tension or discomfort for other people. They just like that everyone has fallen into line. So when you walk on eggshells, it's almost like a manifestation of their power. They even love the idea that they say boo and then people jump. It's the ultimate demonstration of their control. And obviously this is on a continuum. In the case of more severe narcissistic abuse with a more malignant narcissist, they may be keeping that control and the eggshells are proliferated through the threat of or actual violence. In other cases of narcissism, our fear of shame or our belief that we only exist if we are doing what they want or are pleasing them, it's enough to keep us on those eggshells. In a way, the walking on eggshells is a reminder that if you are in a narcissistic relationship, that you are, for all intents and purposes, a hostage to them psychologically, that you basically live in psychological servitude to them. The eggshell walking is a reminder of that almost continuity between them and you, that poor boundary where it's like one of those parasite alien movies where they have fully infiltrated your psyche and sucked it out and stuck pleasing them, right? I've been in enough eggshell walking relationships myself that I remember often wondering, doesn't this person feel bad for how wrecked I am? How much I'm exhausting myself? How sensitive they are? And then I saw, mm, not only don't they, they kind of get off on the power trip that we are all their prisoners. They love that people would jump up when they entered a room. It was sort of a low-grade sadism, and frankly, it was disgusting. Obviously, in some situations, it can be unsafe to do something about it. Violent situations or coercively controlled relationships. But in others, you have to ask yourself, so what if they get angry? You do you. And if the socks are still on the floor or the music is a little too loud or you drop the keys, so what? They'll criticize you and berate you. Ah, you're so clumsy. You're so stupid. They're going to do it anyhow, right? If you're walking on eggshells because you think it will change them, then give it up. It's not going to work. If you're walking on eggshells to avoid their rage, I get it. But if you think they'll notice it and feel bad, that's never going to happen. You walking on eggshells isn't something where they spring up and say, oh, oops, I don't want anyone walking on eggshells for me. They like the idea that all of us are just extensions of them and living to please and convenience them. And that is a grim reminder that walking on eggshells, trying to get it perfect and right, that it's never going to win them over. It's just going to set a precedent that this, this tense, nervous, anxious, eggshell walking tightrope is how it's always going to be. If someone else ever pointed it out, could it bring up shame in them? I think only if they got in trouble for it. We have heard of some workplace cases where people will say, this is an incredibly abusive workplace, but even then, they don't really cop to it. They're just deeply inconvenienced and feel like the whole thing's a witch hunt and they're being victimized. So emotion, kind of, emotions go to narcissistic relationships to die, right? So emotion and narcissistic relationships do not mix. And your emotions, if they don't fully die, they're definitely going to be terribly abused. So think about this. Let me drop it in the comments if you want. What happened when you have expressed emotion in your narcissistic relationship? I'm going to offer you some guesses of what happened. You, ex you expressed genuine emotion in that relationship. You were either mocked, treated with contempt, screamed at, told you were exaggerating, told you that you were too sensitive, told that you have no right to have that feeling. And I'm sure there's others you can add to that I didn't get to. But one that I've been hearing more often and have been hearing for a long time from people is that by showing genuine emotion, that you are being manipulative. That you showing whatever emotion that it may be, tears, anger, whatever, nervousness, that, that it's manipulative. 
The narcissistic person may assert that you're trying to punish them or upset them or throw them off their game on an important day or make them feel bad. So you showing whatever you are feeling, a real feeling, they write that off as manipulative because they don't like how it makes them feel. Now, the downstream effect of this is that most people in narcissistic relationships slowly start expressing less and less emotion, holding back more. They withdraw, they feel numb, they express less. It makes sense. There is really no point in showing the emotion. In fact, it's almost a little risky, right? That if you show your true emotion in one of these relationships, that you're either going to be gaslighted, shut down, deal with more abuse, or just really be invalidated. It doesn't feel good when you're vulnerable. So when you do start over time showing less and less emotion, and in essence, really disengaging, then they may turn around and say you're being manipulative for not being present. So it's a catch-22. If you express emotion, you will be shut down or told you're being manipulative. If you don't show emotion and disengage, then you're being told that you're manipulative. So what are you supposed to do with all that emotion? Well, always remember rule number one, two, three, four, and five in these narcissistic relationships, which is you can't win. It's their rules and radical acceptance means recognizing that. It doesn't mean that you like it. Remember, radical acceptance is like, I'm good with this. It's just understanding that this is the nature of these relationships. You can also see how having a narcissistic parent can really do a number on you, that you, from a very young age, would have either had your emotion regarded with disgust or outright ignored or be told or given the sense that any show of emotion from you was manipulative. People who grow up with narcissistic parents have their emotions pathologized from an early age and learn to tamp down those emotions so they can be a good kid in their parents' eyes. Kids just trying to survive. It's a dangerous message for children to get because over time, they'll doubt their own emotions, clip their emotions, but those emotions have to go somewhere. And some kids may be vulnerable to struggle in lots of ways, which might include anxiety, dysregulation, impulsivity, self-harm, maladaptive behavior such as substance use, disordered eating, or just going into a state of numbness. It can be difficult to learn and give yourself permission to actually express emotion if you were told not to express it as a kid or were made to feel that you were being manipulative by having a feeling. Now this accusation by narcissistic people that your show of emotion, or frankly, your lack thereof is a manipulation is, as you have already likely guessed, a projection. Remember, narcissistic folks are out of control with their emotions. And some people who write about the theories of narcissism argue that narcissistic people are almost allergic to other people's emotions. So they just project their manipulativeness onto other people. And instead of having to deal with the shame of being an icky manipulative person, they just call other people manipulative. Now, the only way to survive in a narcissistic relationship is to disengage, but you have to pick your poison in terms of what you want to be called manipulative for there. Cause you're going to be called manipulative, right? You're either going to be called manipulative for showing emotion, or you're going to be called manipulative for not showing emotion. The radical acceptance is simply that you recognize that however it is, emotions can have no place in this relationship. Each narcissistic relationship is different in its way. For some of you, the safer path is to not show the emotion. And even if they call that behavior out as manipulative, it may leave you feeling less vulnerable with your true emotion. For others of you, it may actually be easier to just get into it with them and not have to endure their haranguing you and baiting you when you don't show emotion. Remember, narcissistic people do not ever like the sense that they did a bad thing. So your emotion, especially negative emotions like tears or sadness, can raise that flag, that sense that they did or said something bad, raise shame and then rage for them. Narcissistic people are not psychopathic. They're not completely devoid of feeling. 
They're just really riddled with shame. So your negative emotion or the sense that maybe they hurt you or other people are gonna think that they hurt you or that they did something that was wrong or bad and that, again, other people will notice that was wrong or bad. It's not that they even care about hurting you. It's that, they do, it's that the narcissistic person doesn't want to be viewed as a person who hurts people or does bad things. The self-image of the narcissistic person that they have to sustain is that they are great. And when that sense of perfection that they attempt to set up gets dinged by someone else's negative emotions, they don't apologize. They just call the other person manipulative. Healthy expression of emotion is good. This is going to be gross what I'm about to say, but it's psychological excretion. It's like the psychological equivalent of taking a pee. Expressing emotion is good for us in so many ways. Got to kind of let it go, right? And when we learn to do it appropriately, for example, express emotion without hurting someone else, that's good. In narcissistic relationships, emotion is expressed by the narcissist but it is often quite unhealthy. Agitation and anger and the silent treatment. I have no doubt that more than a few of you have encountered this situation. There is no safe place to take genuine emotion in a narcissistic relationship. And then on top of that, to have your natural process of emotional expression be labeled as manipulative can continue to fuel self doubt and confusion and self-blame. So when it happens, it's that unfortunate acceptance of the unfortunate nature of these relationships. Your showing emotion is healthy. The narcissistic people have an aversion to it. And the reminder it is to them of who they really are. They don't tolerate anything that ever makes them look like the bad guy or the bad gal or the bad person. But it is so important that you find those safe spaces to take that genuine emotion. Because ultimately, there is no safe space to take those emotions in a narcissistic relationship. And the vulnerability that being in an emotional space is, and then on top of that, being told you're manipulative, is a one-two punch that can cause endless pain in these relationships. Let's talk about this idea, because what I'm talking about this, I, I'm exhausted, I can't do enough. It's a common sentiment in survivors. So, okay, so you do all you can. Let's say your parents getting older, your narcissistic parents getting older, and you just keep trying before they die or they become older or they become more infirm. You don't want to be full of regret. You keep trying and doing and caring and doing what they want. At least it's clear to you that they don't see you by now, you see, they don't see that you have your own life and you're exhausted and they don't notice and you feel like you've been doing this since you were a child. You know why you feel that way? Because they have been doing this to you since you were a child. Now, this same exhaustion feeling can happen in a long-term committed relationship too. You keep doing and trying and you don't want a divorce or you don't want to end the relationship. And maybe you're getting older. Maybe you have children. Whatever the reason is, you keep striving. You keep trying to be attentive and appeasing. You engage in radical acceptance. You disengage. But you're exhausted. The same could happen if this is a relationship with a narcissistic friend or other family like siblings or even co-workers. And then over time, you start to recognize, you start to feel, as many survivors of narcissistic abuse do, that simply being with other people is exhausting. Being with anybody, not even just the narcissistic folks. Some people who have endured long-term narcissistic abuse wonder if they've become introverted or they're socially anxious now or they're socially unskilled. You may find it yourself holding back when you're invited to things, saying no to plans, and assuming that all of this social exhaustion is your fault because you're not doing social right. So this exhaustion you may feel from being with other people, whether it's the narcissistic people in your life you need to care for or just anyone, is what we would expect from survivors of long-term narcissistic abuse. So why is that? Here I'm going to really turn the framing on this to the work of the absolutely brilliant Daniel Shaw, who writes about the impacts of narcissism in relationships, especially 
what happens when a person has a narcissistic parent. He believes that what happens when a person has a narcissistic parent is that the narcissistic parent is very much incapable of fostering something that he calls intersubjectivity, this idea of a relationship characterized by mutual recognition, which is a fancy way of saying you see them and they see you and you see each other as separate entities with separate needs and that's, a, that's good. That when there's, where there's awareness and experience of yourself and the other person, that you could hold on to your own needs and feel safe in holding on to your own sense of self. You can feel safe in expressing your needs, your wants and your aspirations and be able to do so without being shamed or mocked or rejected. Intersubjectivity is literally the opposite of what happens with a narcissistic parent who actually literally resents the child for having needs, shames the child for having needs. The narcissistic parent, like all narcissistic people, is delusionally grandiose. And as part of that, they see themselves as being above having those silly human needs. They disavow those needs because they can't stand seeing themselves as dependent. They project those needs onto the child, which allows the parent to remain grandiose, and the child feels shamed by the parent for having any needs. And the child then internalizes this resentment and the shame projection of the parent, and the child then experiences self-blame and self-loathing for having needs. If you grew up with a narcissistic parent, this was your childhood. So... You, as a child to survive, try to become what the narcissistic parent wants or needs. You attempt to become a mind reader and you give up your wants, your needs, your hopes and your joys to live in the shadow of the narcissistic parent and renounce your needs in favor of what the narcissistic parent wants. And because no child is need free ever, on those moments when there were needs, as hard as you tried to push them down, you were shamed and those moments would turn into self-blame. You, you will feel things like, oh, I shouldn't have needed anything. And that sentiment, I shouldn't need anything, is what you take into adulthood. Well, folks, this cycle doesn't end just because you stop being a child. It remains as long as you and the parent are alive and even after the parent dies. Instead of trying to be quiet or keep your room clean or get good grades like it is a child or just unquestioningly endure, the narcissistic parent's abuse, you probably didn't even know it was abuse, in adulthood, it becomes continuing to silence your needs or pursue professional pursuits that the parent wants for you or get married because the parent expects you to or hide your true wants and hide your true identity and still keep trying to please them. You feel obligated to care for them. And as the narcissistic parent gets older, you may exhaust yourself in the last hurrah, the final act of trying to finally get it right. And the narcissistic parent is always there with their bottomless well of passive aggression and manipulation to leave you feeling guilty or believing that their, their, their belief that feeding and housing you entitles you to forever have to exist in their service. All of this is the most exhausting thing you could imagine because this pattern of surrendering your needs to the parent, which is how your life basically began, starts to sustain in all of your relationships. You end up doing it in all, with everyone, friends, whatever, romantic relationships. And so all relationships become a forfeiting of yourself, of your needs, of your interests. You believe and are almost wired to pawn off yourself to keep a relationship going. So why would a relationship be rewarding to you? Relationships are going to be depleting by definition. So you're literally going to be exhausted by other people because another person means no more needs for you. Now that doesn't mean everything's hopeless. It means recognizing this pattern for what it is. Narcissistic people are like mini cult leaders. They want everyone to succumb to their will and will manipulate them to do so. After a childhood of, in essence, being programmed to believe that your needs are meaningless, your parents should take precedence, and internalizing the shame your parent continues to project because you do not sacrifice yourself for them, that's a big shift. But to end this cycle of exhaustion that's brought about by interpersonal relationships means seeing yourself and appreciating yourself as separate 
as an individual separate, not only from the narcissist, but from all the other human beings with your own needs, your own wants, your own hopes, your own desires, and your own life, that there's no shame in who you are and what you need. And that if a narcissistic person rejects you, you're going to be fine. You're going to be more than fine. But they constantly dangle that sense of, I'm going to reject you. And that's how they keep their power. That's only how they keep their power if the rejection is a problem. This isn't easy. It means pain, grief, mourning, fear, none of which is pleasant. It's actually kind of easier to keep doing and doing and doing until you drop instead of not doing what they want and feeling the pain, which for many people can feel more scary and hopeless. To push back on this means about a thousand small actions you can take every day. Taking the time to know your preferences and enjoy them. Paying attention to friendships and relationships where you are heard. And in fact, taking the time after a social encounter to pay attention. Was I seen or heard in that interaction? And I say this as a survivor. After any social interaction, I pay attention to whether I feel less tense or happy or stronger. When I do, those people are the keepers. These are not easy cycles to end. It takes time. It typically takes therapy. But it is also the radical acceptance. None of us can make the narcissist happy because narcissists don't do happy. They do control. So sacrificing yourself and your identity to make someone else happy, that's not love. That's abnegation. And what they are doing, shaming you for having needs and shaming you for having a separate self outside of them and expecting you to remain hostage to them, well, that's theft. This exhaustion is normal in survivors. It's not just the exhaustion of dealing with toxic people. It's the exhaustion of every social interaction feeling like a loss of your sovereignty and a sacrifice of your need and your identity. With healthy people, they will recognize you and see you because that is what healthy people do. You can have that relationship where both people are seen and heard. That is mutual recognition. This is literally impossible with a narcissistic person. And far too many people have exhausted themselves and given up their lives in the name of trying to please that narcissist one last time. The fact is we are all responsible for our own happiness, our own joy. So stop hitching your wagon to theirs and stop giving up yours in the empty pursuit of trying to make them happy. There is no version of this story where you will do enough for them. So just do what feels right to you and take your life back. It's the only path forward. Thanks again.